Okay, thanks very much, um, David. I'm going to talk a little bit about percutaneous interventions in the tricuspid valve and spend a little bit more time, I guess, taking you through a case which illustrates a number of the points um, about interventions in this space. You've heard of um, a nice, a very nice overview from David about tricuspid valve disease. We've, we've ignored it for a long time. We often thought it would get better when we fixed the left-sided lesions that it might be associated with. And uh, it was just adding pump time, adding complexity to the surgery. We weren't sure what we were, we were gaining out of intervening on it. Um, and you know, we knew that uh, tricuspid regurgitates are very common, common in the population, maybe up to nearly 20% of at least mild TR. And even severe TR is relatively common in the population, 1% in uh, Framingham studies. And we've talked about the various um, classifications and settings in which it may occur, either isolated or in conjunction with left-sided valve disease, congenital, acquired, or primary or secondary. But apart from all of this, it's really now well established that intervention in tricuspid valve is important. It impacts on, on prognosis. And more frequently, we're seeing tricuspid valve surgery and interventions combined um, with oper into the operation. Um, and what this brings us to the table is a need for re-intervention down the track. So we're seeing inevitably bioprosthesis that are degenerating. And to redo that surgery, it carries a significant risk with um, raised mortality rates, something of the order of 15 to 30% for re-operating on tricuspid valves in published series. And many of these patients, as you'll see from the one I'm about to show you, have had many operations. Um, transcatheter valve in valve now is a new procedure, it's a new treatment option, as you heard from David. About 85% of these procedures end up occurring for adult congenital heart disease, um, and two-thirds of them are for stenosis of the biprosthesis. I'll also mention at the end just um, a number of new pipeline technologies for my tricuspid valve repair. So let's talk about this case that we have, which I think illustrates a number of these points uh, nicely. We have a 23-year-old female who presented um, to us with a very complex past history of adult congenital heart disease. She had tetralogy of fallow, obviously, as her um, primary condition, a VSD patch enclosure, RVOT homograph, suture closure for PDA, 1990 as a, as a child, uh, obviously as an infant, Re reconstruction of the pulmonary valve and tricuspid annuloplasty two years later, tricuspid valve repair with a ring and then a pulmonary valve uh, five years after that, then a tricuspid bioprosthesis, a mosaic 31, and a 25 millimeter pulmonary homograft, um, another eight years along the track. And this is the pattern of uh, recurrent surgeries required in intervening in patients in this space. Diastolic dysfunction is a problem, pulmonary hypertension is a problem, the patient has left SVC. As, as many of these patients uh, experience arrhythmia, so atrial flutter, typical. Uh, often difficult to ablate, complex, related to previous surgeries and dilatation of the right atrium. She had asthma, iron deficiency, she was obese, the BMI of 42, which impacts on the morbidity and mortality of surgery. Had chronic liver disease um, with a, a NASH type picture and uh, passive congestion of the liver. So this is a sort of typical case that we're often faced with, you know, it's quite complicated. What is the risk of reoperating in this situation? And what's the longevity that do we get out of these valves? Um, if it's a bioprosthetic, you know, about 60% of these are started to degenerate at five years. 20% will be need to be reoperated on by 10 years. So what do we do? Um, these valves degenerate due to wear and tear, calcification, penis, infection can occur or thrombosis. And this is what we were faced with when we uh, had a look at her echo. A very stenotic, um, perhaps some penis, some calcification, um, a quite degenerative bioprosthesis. And at the time, um, the, the role of um, valve in valve was just emerging. So we thought, well, let's um, balloon this valve and see if we can palliate it that way. Her predominant um, uh, hemodynamic lesion was stenosis. Um, TR is better tolerated. Uh, acute TR is reasonably well tolerated in this patient group, unlike uh, bioprosthetic and mitral and aortic valves. Um, so we proceeded to undertake balloon valvoplasty to this uh, lesion. We crossed it. 
of significant gradients across the valve in the setting of a right heart failure. We perform balloon valvuloplasty using a 25 by 50 millimetre bulk crystal balloon. You can see the indentation on the balloon there. I've got a stiff wire up in the pulmonary artery. And you can see the balloon being inflated. We had toe guidance for this. And at the time we were trying to get some, we thought it would be wise to get some measurements of the valve. We could use the balloon to actually fairly accurately size what that annulus is. Because um, as I'll explain to you, trying to know the exact size of these degenerative bioprostheses can be difficult. Um, and post-intervention, she got a reasonably good result. A lot of the tricuspid stenosis was relieved and she was left with moderate TR acutely. And she managed to limp on for another three years before she presented with severe right heart failure again. So she ended up gaining something like 15 kilos in weight from right heart failure, um, which had sort of, uh, being obese, she would gained it very uh, incrementally over time and I don't think people realised. And by the time she was referred back to us, she had a, a very significant tricuspid stenosis. So um, what are the treatment options? Obviously, you can reoperate. Um, but uh, the surgeons were certainly not lining up to reoperate on this lady in the first instance. Um, you can do valvoplasty again, but we got barely three years out of that, um, and it was a, a less than satisfactory sort of approach. And increasingly, as uh, David outlined, there's some experience with transcatheter valve in valve as a treatment option. And the advent of transcatheter valve replacement for aortic stenosis uh, has really been a quantum shift in how we manage valve disease of this type. Uh, and at this stage, we'd had a lot more experience with this and felt confident in uh, proceeding to consider a valve in valve as a treatment option for her. When you start to consider these treatment options in these patients, I think it is uh, complex because there are many different bioprosthetic types. The way in which they're structured is very different. Each of them have a, a different uh, construct and engineering. They're stentless. There's stented that occur in the supraannular position, the annular stented, and then there are externally mounted leaflets. The majority of the leaflets are mounted within a frame. And all of these add their own complexity. So you really do need to know what exact bioprosthesis you're dealing with, how it's been engineered, and then it comes a, a big question is, you know, what is the size? What kind of valve are you going to put inside it? And all of the companies provide you with millimetre sizes, but each company has a different way of sizing their valve. Some of them size it according to, according to the internal diameter, some to the outer diameter, some to the external sewing ring diameter. So it can be really quite difficult to know what is a 31 millimeter valve? What does that mean for the internal diameter of that valve? And what does it mean for the valve that you're going to put inside? They all have very different radiographic footprints to help guide you in where to place the valve. Um, this all sounds very complicated, and it is, but fortunately, um, Vinnie Papat, who's a surgeon in London who, who started to pioneer valve and valve treatments, a uh, smart guy, um, came up with an app that you can download straight off iTunes onto your phone, onto your iPad, plug in all the details of these patients, the size, the type of valve, the position, and he'll give you an answer, exactly what valve you need to put inside it. Sounds very simple, right? And uh, he'll even play you a little video of one they did on the bench top, uh, which is great. So you can see why we felt a bit more confident now about approaching this. The issue is for this patient, um, while most of the published literature is with Melody, this was far too big for a Melody valve. So we needed to think about a new approach. And those that, that are worldwide experience of only 15 that David talked about was all with Melody. Um, Nevertheless, we thought we'd, there's sufficient experience now to probably tackle this. It was recommended that we use a 29mm Sapien XT um, to treat this condition. And here, again, imaging is very important in guiding uh, and helping plan this procedure. Here as we're crossing that bi stenose bioprosthesis, and you can see quite clearly in the imaging just how stenosis this valve is and degenerative is. Uh, here we have a um, wire across the valve. We've uh, anchored a very stiff wire out in the lung field in the left lower lobe to help act as a very firm rail upon which to deliver um, a, uh, balloons and then a, a valve. Here's a 4 by 20 millimeter, 20 millimeter Edwards balloon going in. This comes in the pack with the Sapien and we've pre-delayed it 
so that we could ensure that we're able to deliver that um, that transcatheter valve uh, without hindrance. You can see after inflating a balloon, we've really have led to significant degeneration, and this, this leaflet looks pretty frail. There's a lack of coaption and quite significant TR after that. But we certainly allowed us uh, some relief of the stenosis to deliver um, the transcatheter valve, and that's important because. Unlike a melody, the sapien valve does not come covered. It's exposed. So um, you, you don't want to have that um, move off the uh, balloon. So here's the valve coming out. We load it in the body here, We're taking some measurements. Because with this particular valve, there, you don't see a frame. You just see uh, dots on the pillars, the tops of the pillars. The actual annulus is here. Um, so you don't have a nice frame to guide you as where to place it. And this means that the echo becomes very important. So here's the rather stiff Sapien XT delivery system coming up. Remember, it's designed for uh, transcatheter treatment of the aortic valve. Um, but we're able to get a very stable rail here on that stiff wire. And we're able to deliver it into the frame. And then we're able to start to line this up. And like I said, I think echo is very useful. And Greg provided us with the toe support here. And we're able to get beautiful. Uh, images on 3D Echo that, you know, five and ten years ago we just wouldn't have that um, helped guide that intervention. Um, we're able to carefully place the valve and then inflate it and you'll see the dog boning of the balloon as it settles into the frame and final delivery of the transcatheter valve in valve. Of course, we've had to mount it in reverse to what we normally would for a, an aortic valve replacement. And here you can see beautifully on the 3D toe the valve inflating and being expanded by a balloon, and then you can see the immediate post implantation result here with uh, no stenosis, the um, bioprosthetic leaflets that were very degenerative, calcified, and stenosed have been pushed aside, and we've got uh, good, good flow, no gradient across the valve, and no regurgitation, no paravalve leak. So um, that's a good introduction to a patient in whom tricuspid valve interventions by the transcatheter route really important and it gives us a little bit of a microcosm of, of how transcatheter uh, valve interventions are placed in the spectrum of uh, uh, clinical therapies for tricuspid valve disease. Now there are some other new developments in this field. There's a lot of excitement around the tricuspid valve. It's no longer the sort of neglected valve. Um, a lot of energy is going into trying to develop percutaneous ways to deal with tricuspid regurgitation. Um, there are various cinching systems which were, have been developed for the mitral valve that are now being applied to tricuspid position. Of course, it's a more complex valve. It's a different shape. There are three leaflets rather than just two. Um, but they're getting some headway, and there's been some initial experience with these. Um, the the uh, mitral-aligned system is a cinching system. Uh, Francesco Massano sort of did a lot of work around this, placing pledgets underneath the... Uh, valve and trying to mimic a, a K repair um, here by placing percutaneous cinches and then pulling these together. Um, interesting approach, some initial experience with it. And this is how it's delivered percutaneously. Uh, may have some promise, but again, the anatomy is very complex. What about mitral clip? Um, we've got experience with mitral clip. Um, it's, it's a very useful treatment, particularly for functional MR, but also for degenerative. People have suggested, well, could this be used in the tricuspid position? Um, and maybe, because it does seem to reduce tricuspid regurgitation if you replace sequential clips between leaflets. Um, it doesn't seem to reduce it to much more than moderate. Um, so it may be useful in very severe cases in whom patients have no other option. And it's a very similar approach either via the transfemoral route or via the transjugular. I can tell you I would not like to be putting one of these in transjugular. There's about 24 French and uh, quite a bulky device. But nevertheless, uh, it may be a treatment option for select patients with severe TR and few other options. Um, this is an interesting concept from Edwards um, in which they've provided a device that dwells between the leaflets. It's implanted by the subclavian and it, it acts as a sort of coaption surface to try and improve, not coaption between leaflets, but coaption between the leaflets and a third party. Uh, an interesting idea, and there's some initial, uh, very few, 
but some first in man experience about how this might work. Um, I present these to you not to say that they're, they're the shape of what things might look like in the future, but to give you an idea that there's a lot of thought and idea and engineering going into tricuspid valve interventions. <coughs> and then in the, over the next decade, I think we'll see more and more uh, technologies adapted to dealing with tricuspid regurgitation by the percutaneous route. Um, so in conclusion, <laughs> there is increasing recognition of the importance of tricuspid valve disease. Uh, percutaneous interventions do have a place, an increasing place in the treatment of particularly of bioprosthetic tricuspid valve dysfunction and soon native tricuspid valve disease. Thank you.